welcome to the third lecture on uh, refrigeration and air conditioning in the first two lessons we have discussed the historical aspects of uh, various refrigeration cycles refrigerants and compressors so in this lesson let's look at some of the important applications of uh, refrigeration so the objectives of this lesson are to introduce applications of refrigeration particularly in uh, food processing and preservation in chemical and process industries and some special applications of refrigeration and then uh, to introduce the applications of air conditioning in uh, for industrial and for comfort uh, applications and at the end of the lesson you should be able to list various applications of refrigeration and air conditioning uh, list typical conditions required for various food products and processes and state pertinent issues such as energy efficiency indoor air quality etc now before uh, um, uh, discussing the applications in detail let's uh, look at the relationship between refrigeration and air conditioning normally they are clubbed together uh, refrigeration and air conditioning what is the relationship between them uh, we club refrigeration and air conditioning because uh, air conditioning is one of the largest uh, i mean uh, uh, users of refrigeration air con uh, refrigeration is required uh, in summer air conditioning for cooling and dehumidification of air uh, that is the reason why we normally club these two systems together uh, refrigeration systems can al also be used for winter air conditioning if you are using the refrigeration system as a heat pump this picture here shows the relationship between refrigeration and air conditioning you can see that uh, you have the uh, area of refrigeration on one side so this is the field of uh, refrigeration and this is the field of air conditioning and there is a large area of overlapping this overlapping area is because of Uh, cooling and dehumidification in cooling and dehumidification one has to cool uh, the air and one has to reduce the moisture content of air this requires uh, a refrigeration system and by far as i said this is the largest uh, uh, application of refrigeration so this is the relationship between and as i was telling you you can also use refrigeration systems in this area if you are using refrigeration system as a heat pump okay so now let us uh, Uh, look at applications of refrigeration can be uh, grouped into four major uh, uh, areas the first one is food processing preservation and distribution and the second application is chemical in chemical and process industries and the third application is as i said some miscellaneous special application which we will see later and the fourth application is in the area of comfort air conditioning these are the four major uh, applications of refrigeration now let's look at uh, the application of refrigeration in food processing preservation and uh, distribution in fact this is one of the classical uh, applications of refrigeration and is one of the most important applications of refrigeration uh, we know very well that uh, food products can be stored for a longer time if you are uh, keeping them at low temperatures so for example our experience tells us that uh, the food products can be stored for a longer time in winter compared to summer similarly if you are keeping them inside a refrigerator they can be preserved for a longer time that means you can do the preservation at low temperatures this fact is very well known uh, and uh, you can store both live products as well as dead products uh, for a longer time if you are keeping them at low temperatures let's see what are the live and dead products live products are typically products which can breathe which undergo the process of respiration uh these are just like any living beings and the examples of live products are fruits vegetables etc and the live products get spoiled because of two reasons one is because of uh, the bacterial activity and the second reason is because of enzymatic processing Th these are the two main reasons behind the decay of live products like fruits and vegetables now let us look at dead products dead products means they don't respire or anything and uh, products like fish uh, meat they come under the category of dead products and dead products get spoiled because of uh, bacterial activity and it is it has been shown that uh, both the bacterial activity as well as enzymatic processing can be reduced at low temperatures now let me show the effect of temperature on storage life this table here shows uh, how uh, the storage temperature affects the average useful storage life you can see that for example if you are keeping uh, storing meat at 0 degree centigrade then the useful storage life is 6 to 10 days whereas if the temperature is 22 degree centigrade then you can store it only for one day and if the temperature is 38 degree centigrade the storage uh, life is less than a day so you can see the dramatic change in uh, storage life with temperature similarly for other products everywhere you can see that 
as you are increasing the temperature the useful storage life is reducing so this is the uh, uh, principle behind uh, food preservation using refrigeration one thing you uh, you can uh, notice here is that compared to products uh, uh, normal products products in dried form can be stored for a much longer time for example meat meat uh, at 0 uh, degree centigrade it can be stored uh, for 6 to 10 days but a uh, dry meat can be stored for more than 1000 days that means you can store uh, meat in the form of a uh, dry meat for more than 3 years uh, what is the reason behind this the reason is like this uh, the decay depends not only on the temperature but it also depends upon the uh, presence of uh, water in the form of liquid inside the product so when there is uh, water uh, the bacteria become more active this is what is known as water activity so in the presence of water plus high temperatures the decay will be faster whereas if there is no water for example in dried products the decay will be very very slow this is the reason behind the drying of food products and storing them for a long uh, periods now uh, let's discuss a very important aspect called cold chain if you want to uh, preserve food uh, food products effectively you have to maintain what is known as a cold chain uh, let's look at a typical cold chain for fresh products it consists of the following steps uh, the first step is uh, refrigeration is required for uh, post harvest treatment that means uh, as soon as food products uh, fresh uh, products like fruits and vegetables as soon as they are harvested they have to be cooled to remove the um, heat of harvesting post harvest heat so you uh, this is the first um, uh, step in any cold chain and the second step as soon as you remove the post harvest heat you have to transport the food products to a food processing plants and transporting has to be done in a refrigerated truck or a refrigerated vehicle so this is the second step the third step during food processing you find that most of the food processing uh, processes require uh, refrigeration so this is the third step in cold chain and the fourth step is uh, storage of uh, the uh, processed food in large warehouses known as cold storages and uh, then the fifth step is uh, after you store them in cold storage for a long time they have to be distributed to the customers so you first you take them from the cold storage and send it to retail supermarkets and again refrigeration is required in retail supermarket also so this is the uh, fifth step in a cold chain and the last step is when the customer buys the food products from the uh, retail supermarket he will take them and he'll store it in his home domestic refrigerator so this is the last step in uh, typical um uh, cold chain and uh, you have to uh, remember that refrigeration is required throughout the six steps, uh, steps and even if one step is not proper then the food pro preservation will not be effective uh, and similar uh, cold chains can also be thought of for frozen food products let me show you a typical refrigeration plant for a cold storage this shows the photograph of an ammonia based refrigeration plant for a large cold storage normally ammonia is one very popular refrigerant uh, used in uh, large cold storages you you may be remembering that in the last uh, two classes i mentioned that ammonia is very good for large systems because of its excellent properties and also because it's uh, inexpensive and easily available so most of the cold storages use ammonia as a refrigerant and here uh, what the photograph shows is a large refrigeration plant for a cold storage system now let us look at uh, uh benefits of the cold ch cold chain what are the benefits of uh, a typical cold chain the cold chain uh, reduces the food spoilage that's very obvious and uh, excess crop of fruits uh, or vegetables you can uh, store them and you can distribute them during the off uh, off season or you can uh, for peak demand you can uh, store them for peak demand Uh, this is the second advantage of uh, uh, any cold chain especially for seasonal foods and the third advantage is uh, you can make these food products available in places where they are not grown and because thanks to refrigeration you are able to get uh, apples produced in australia or in far off countries so they have to be shipped from that place to our country which requires refrigeration so this is another advantage of cold chain and the fourth advantage of cold chain uh, is uh, it can, you can avoid distress selling by the farmers that means uh, during the peak season Uh, there are no buyers there is too much of supply and less demand so uh, in the absence of cold storages the farmer has to sell it at throw away prices so this can be avoided if you have proper uh, cold storage facilities so that during the season uh, you st store the excess crop and you sell them during off season so that it's very beneficial to the customer so the cold chain uh, and uh, is very very important uh, especially because of the large uh, population growth and reduced uh, land for farming 
uh, and typically it is said that in countries like India about 30 percent of our uh, farm produce and the fruits and vegetables are spoiled because of lack of uh, proper cold storage facilities. Uh, so this is uh, very very important and uh, realizing this the government has actually given a lot of benefits for setting up cold storages etc. Now uh, what are the conditions required for storage of food products? Uh, uh, it's not that uh, all the food products require the same conditions for storage. It's not so. You, uh, every product has an optimum storage conditions. Uh, and uh, the storage life generally depends on uh, the type of the product stored, uh, the temperature at which product is stored, and uh, moisture content and humidity inside the cold storage, and air velocity inside the cold storage. So these are the four factors. Uh, uh, of course, there is one more factor uh, that is the initial quality of the food products. So for example, the products uh, which are brought to the cold storage, if they themselves are bad, then you can't uh, guarantee a lo long storage life. So these are the five important factors which decide the storage life of food products. Let me show the photograph of a uh, cold storage. Uh, Uh, this photograph uh, shows a typical uh, cold storage and you can see how products are stacked and uh, uh, they are packed and they are stacked. Typical uh, cold storage looks like this and you can also use this kind of cold storages for uh, uh, storing many fruits, vegetables, uh, frozen foods, etc. In India, typically storage of potatoes in cold storage is very popular. This shows the typical uh, recommended storage uh, conditions for fruits and vegetables. Uh, shown here are the food products, the storage temperature at which they have to be stored and the relative humidity and the maximum recommended storage time and the storage time uh, for uh, tropical countries. You can see that the storage temperature in general varies between 0 degree centigrade to 20, 20 degree centigrade. I am talking about uh, the storage of fresh products. That means they are not in frozen condition but they are in the condition in which they have uh, harvested. And uh, you can see that for most of the products, the required relative humidity is quite high. That means you have to maintain very high uh, relative humidity inside the storage space. This is required because uh, if the relative humidity is low, then uh, food products will lose moisture. That means it will lead to weight loss because of uh, drying. So you have to maintain a high relative humidity. Of course, for products like uh, onions and uh, pumpkin you really do not require very high relative humidity because they have a thick skin and the moisture loss is very less. And you can also see here that the maximum recommended storage time varies anywhere between few days to a few months depending upon the type of the products. And you can also notice that uh, the storage time in general uh, is less in tropical com countries compared to cold countries. Now let us look at uh,
let's look at the storage of other food products food products such as meat fish poultry they can be stored for longer period in frozen conditions the reason behind this is also same as um, that of a dry product when you are uh, freezing a food products uh, you are actually uh, temporarily stopping the water activity because in frozen condition water will be available in the form of ice so the water activity is considerably reduced so the bacterial activity is also reduced thereby you can increase the storage life of food products then uh, food products like uh, dairy products like milk butter ice cream etc they require refrigeration at various temperature during processing and also during storage for example milk as soon as milk is uh, uh, taken from the cows they require uh, pre cooling that means uh, immediately after a uh, cow is milked the milk has to be pre cooled and then in that pre cooled condition it it will be sent to a dairy plant a dairy farm where it has to be heated to 73 degrees centigrade for pasteurization then after the it has to be cooled to 4 degrees centigrade and it's uh, stored at 4 degrees centigrade so you require uh, about 13 to 15 degrees uh, centigrade for pre cooling and about 4 degrees centigrade for storing milk whereas uh, products uh, milk products like ice cream and all require much lower temperature for example the optimum or recommended storage temperature for ice cream is about minus 30 degrees centigrade and uh, uh, other pro milk products like butter they require slightly higher temperature they require about 7 to 10 degrees centigrade so you can see that different uh, uh, milk products require different temperatures and a dairy plant which produces all these milk products require uh, refrigeration plants which can uh, provide different temperatures and different conditions and uh, refrigeration is also required uh, in uh, uh, breweries and all uh, and for also for, uh, for processing and storage of cold drinks uh, for fruit juices for wine beer etc and uh, drinks like wine beer etc refrigeration is required because uh, they involve a process of fermentation and fermentation is an exothermic uh, process so heat is released during the making of wine or beer so that heat has got to be taken out so that's the reason why we require refrigeration in uh, the breweries let's look at uh, frozen food storage uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, frozen foods can be stored for a longer time uh, compared to fresh foods this is because of the reduced bacterial activity and uh, normally freezing should be done rapidly to reduce the ice crystal growth this is very very important that means uh, not only the final temperature is uh, important but also the rate at which the food products are uh, frozen you have to rapidly freeze the food products so that the ice crystal growth can be minimized now what happens if you uh, freeze it slowly if you freeze it slowly the ice crystals inside the food products they become bigger and they damage the cellular structure of the food products so to avoid this we have to uh, freeze food products uh, very fast so typically any uh, freezing uh, food freezing uh, equipment uh, must provide large refrigeration capacity so that the moment you bring the products they can be uh, frozen fast so let me show some of the well, or let me name some of the uh, freezers used in industries for uh, freezing food products we have what is known as blast freezing uh, blast freezers using a blast freezing technique and we have contact freezers we have immersion freezers and uh, also known as uh, another one is what is known as individual quick freezing uh, these are the techniques employed in industries for freezing of food products normally as i was mentioning uh, you require large refrigeration capacities as the process has got to be rapid and sometimes instead of using a refrigeration system uh, liquid nitrogen or solid carbon dioxide is used for rapid uh, freezing of food products this is also quite effective and there is another process uh, of food preservation known as uh, freeze drying in freeze drying what is done is uh, you first freeze the food product that means once you convert all the water in the food product into ice then you dry the product by sublimation that means this uh, freeze drying process involves two steps first uh, freezing the food products then uh, the process of sublimation during which all the water stored in the food product in the form of ice will be sublimated so finally you end up with a, a dry product uh, devoid of any water so this is a technique used for producing uh, products like uh, instant coffee milk powder etc and uh, this is very effective uh, technique because uh, uh, the quality of the product will be generally good compared to normal freezing or normal drying and uh, since this is a costly process this process is generally used for special applications uh, such as in uh, space or military applications where weight is a very important factor so what is done is food products are uh, freeze dried 
so you have a very light uh, food product and uh, which can be stored for a longer time and when the user wants to consume it all he has to do is he has to add water to the product and then you can consume it so this is a very popular um, uh, technique for this kind of special applications no uh, of course uh, as you know very well uh, domestic refrigerator thanks to the development in vapor compression uh, refrigeration technology domestic refrigeration for uh, food preservation at customers place has become so popular that it is one of the most uh, important or necessary uh, appliances in any home in all developed countries and also in developing countries and uh, <coughs> of late particularly in uh, developed countries and also in uh, big cities the supermarket refrigeration has become uh, quite popular supermarket refrigeration means as i was mentioning uh, earlier uh, food products will be stored in cold storage and uh, from the cold storage you have to bring them and you have to store them uh, in a supermarket so that customers can buy them and the supermarkets also require refrigeration otherwise they get uh, spoiled so supermarket refrigeration is again a different uh, you require a different uh, design methodology for supermarket refrigeration because a large variety of products are stored and uh, these products require different uh, storage conditions and all and the refrigeration systems used for supermarket refrigeration have got to be very very reliable because of the cost of the products stored so this is actually a challenging job to ensure uh, an efficient at the same time uh, uh, very reliable system uh, for supermarket refrigeration i'll just show a typical uh, photograph of a supermarket uh, so this shows the section of a supermarket uh, with refrigerated display cases and all you can see that how different products are uh, stored and all these products are under refrigerated conditions and refrigeration is also required in uh, areas like uh, remote and rural areas uh, for storing uh, farm produce and for dairy products etc uh, and one problem with uh, remote and rural areas is they may not have access to grid power that means uh, they may not get electricity from the grid so you have to have systems which don't depend on grid uh, but uh, which are also reliable so now let us look at applications of refrigeration in chemical and process industries uh, it is used for separation and liquefaction of gases in petrochemical industries and refineries refrigeration is also required for removal of heat of reaction in various chemical industries it is required for dehumidification of air, process air in pharmaceutical industries and it's also required for recovery of solvents and storage of low boiling liquids in various uh, chemical industries and let's look at some of the special applications of refrigeration refrigeration is required in manufacturing because in manufacturing uh, cold treatment of metals uh, and uh, metals uh, and precision parts and cutting tools is carried out to improve uh, the dimensional accuracy of the precision parts and to improve the hardness wear resistance and tool life of various materials and tools so this is one of the very important uh, application of refrigeration in manufacturing and refrigeration is also required in medical as you know uh, it's required for storage of blood plasma tissues vaccines etc and it's also required for manufacture and storage of a wide variety of drug and sometimes refrigeration is also used uh, for uh, local anesthesia and uh, in construction <coughs> refrigeration is required for two purposes the first purpose is for during the setting of concrete uh, the setting of concrete and mixing and setting of concrete is an exothermic uh, reaction that means uh, heat is released during setting of concrete now if you look at the uh, huge walls for example the walls of a dam and all when they are uh, during setting lot of uh, heat is released because of the exothermic process and this heat has to be rejected from the wall and uh, if the heat rejection is not efficient what happens is temperature uh, uh, gradients will develop inside the wall and this will lead to thermal stresses which will finally lead to cracks so to avoid uh, the cracks um, uh, thick walls require uh, artificial refrigeration techniques so what is done normally is in large uh, walls of the dams and all uh, pipes are buried through which either a refrigerant or a chilled water flows which takes the heat of uh, the setting process and keeps the temperature gradients uh, small so that there uh, there won't be any appreciable uh, thermal stress development so this is one of the applications of refrigeration in construction and uh, refrigeration is also used uh, sometimes for freezing of wet soils 
to facilitate excavation. This particularly happens in cold countries where the soil becomes uh, frozen and if you want to do excavation, uh, you have to freeze it first and then do the excavation. And uh, refrigeration is also required, sometimes it is also used for desalination of water by freezing. As you know, desalination can be done uh, in two ways, either you can uh, boil the water and collect the, uh, and then condense the water vapor or the other method is uh, you can uh, freeze the salt water. So when you are freezing the salt water, what happens is the salt does not freeze uh, uh, first, so first the water part freezes. So the what you get uh, out of the uh, frozen salt uh, solution is uh, uh, comparatively pure water. So this is one of the methods by which you can uh, do the desalination. And of course, uh, refrigeration is also required in uh, for manufacture of ice, ice cubes, ice flakes, etc. Nowadays, uh, commercial uh, uh, ice makers are available using which you can uh, produce ice in a wide variety of ways, uh, like in the form of cubes or flakes, etc. And uh, refrigeration is also required uh, in uh, a preparation of ice skating rings. For example, in uh, summer season, if you want to have ice skating rings, uh, then using artificial refrigeration, you can uh, um, provide um, ice skating rings for uh, skating purposes. So what is generally done is uh, uh, refrigeration pipes are buried inside the water and when the refrigeration system runs, the water freezes and uh, uh, ice is formed and uh, which can be used for skating purposes. And uh, refrigeration is also required a uh, very uh, important application for storage of uh, vaccines uh, in remote and rural areas like uh, vaccines like po uh, polio vaccine, etc. Um, let me show uh, a photograph of uh, a storage system for uh, vaccines. Uh, you know, this is a solar energy based uh, system. Uh, this picture here uh, shows a solar uh, energy driven refrigeration system for vaccine storage. What we have here uh, is a photovoltaic uh, array. Uh, this photovoltaic array converts uh, solar energy into electricity, uh, direct uh, DC current uh, electricity. Uh, and uh, this DC current uh, can be used for running a vapor compression refrigerator here. Okay, of course, you can also use the DC current for running a uh, thermoelectric uh, reference system, but in this particular schematic, uh, a vapor compression uh, uh, refrigerator is used, which is connected to the photovoltaic array here. This is the photo photovoltaic array. And uh, sometimes solar energy may, may not be available, so or sometimes uh, excess solar energy may be required. So to take care of the variations in solar radiations, uh, we have here a charge controller and also a storage battery. That means a typical uh, photovoltaic driven uh, reference system requires uh, a photovoltaic array, a charge controller and a rechargeable battery plus a refrigeration system. In this particular uh, um, uh, picture, a vapor compression refrigeration system is used. Of course, you can also use the solar energy directly instead of converting it into heat. You can also use it directly and have a vapor absorption refrigeration system. Of course, in general, absorption systems are uh, bulkier compared to uh, uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems. So either uh, a thermoelectric refrigeration system using uh, PV modules or a vapor compression system using PV mo modules are uh, popular. Of course, nowadays people are also developing uh, absorption uh, systems using solar energy for remote and rural areas. Now let us uh, look at applications of uh, uh, air conditioning. So air conditioning is basically required for uh, two purposes. One the very important um, uh, application of air conditioning is in the area of uh, what is known as comfort air conditioning. And the second application of air conditioning is uh, for industrial applications. And uh, what is the purpose of comfort air conditioning? As the name implies, uh, the objective of any comfor comfort air conditioning system is to provide thermal comfort to the occupants. And uh, what is the objective of 
an industrial uh, air conditioning system. An industrial air conditioning system is required uh, so that uh, you can provide the required uh, conditions for uh, processes to be carried out in an efficient way or products can be produced in an efficient way. So, you have uh, comfort air conditioning and uh, industrial air conditioning. Now, let us look at uh, comfort air conditioning. As I was telling, the objective of a comfort air conditioning system is to provide thermal comfort. Now, how do we define thermal comfort? Thermal comfort may be defined as the state of mind which expresses satisfaction with the surroundings. Uh, this is the uh, uh, definition of thermal comfort. And uh, thermal comfort uh, uh, generally depends upon maintaining certain uh, temperatures of a human body. For example, the core of a human body has to be maintained at a temperature of about 37 degrees centigrade. If this temperature varies by even 1 or 2 degrees, then human beings uh, feel very uncomfortable. And if the temperature uh, variation becomes large, then it can become uh, fatal or it can uh, lead to uh, uh, irreparable damages. Normally, the comfort air conditioning uh, is used to maintain uh, the temperature at about 37 degrees centigrade. So, without doing any extra effort, the peop, uh, person can feel comfortable. Now, let us look at a uh, uh, little bit of physics behind uh, a comfort air conditioning. Uh, a human body for all uh, uh, engineering, practical engineering purposes can be treated as a heat engine. That means, uh, a human body consumes uh, food and the chemical energy stored in the food is converted into uh, heat and work and the work part is used for uh, certain bodily functions and the heat part is used for uh, maintaining the human body at a cert uh, certain temperature level and whatever excess heat is there has got to be finally rejected to the surroundings. So, any uh, living human being will be continuously rejecting uh, heat uh, produced inside the body to the surroundings and the rate at which heat is rejected depends upon the uh, external conditions. So, as I was telling, uh, uh, the, the conditions of the surroundings affects the temperature of the body and the basis of the comfort air conditioning system is to maintain the right surroundings so that the human body can reject heat um, in a comfortable manner. Let us look at the comfort conditions. Uh, what are the requirements uh, for a typical occupied space so that a person can feel comfortable in the occupied space? Generally, the um, uh, temperatures, what is known as an operative temperature of the conditioned space should be between 20 to 26 degrees centigrade. And uh, the humidity, humidity or moisture content should be uh, corresponding to a dew point temperature of 2 to 17 degrees centigrade. So, you can see that for uh, humidity, there is a larger uh, uh, bandwidth. And you also have to maintain certain uh, air motion or certain velocity of air inside the occupied space so that a uh, human being can feel comfortable. And this required uh, air velocity the, the, um, uh, falls in the range of po about 0 0.15 meter uh, per second to about 0 0.25 meter per second. If the air velocity is too low, uh, uh, human being feels uh, stagnant and um, he will have a, an uncomfortable feeling. And if the air velocity is very high, then he will have the problem of drafts. So, air velocity also has got to be maintained uh, uh, within a range. And the exact value, I mean uh, I have, uh, what I have given here is a range of values. So, the exact value depends upon several factors. For example, it depends upon uh, the type of clothing a person is wearing. For example, if a person is wearing very heavy clothing, then uh, uh, he require lower temperature is required in the conditioned space. And if a person is wearing light clothing, then you can uh, go for a higher uh, temperature in the conditioned spacing. So, ultimately the optimum uh, temperature to be maintained depends upon several factors. Another important factor is activity. For example, a person is doing uh, very light activity, then uh, the required temperature will be uh, higher. And if the person is doing very vigorous activity, for example, in uh, gyms, etc., then you have to maintain low temperature. Uh, the reason for uh, this is, of course, uh, when the activity is high, uh, more uh, heat is produced. So, more heat has got to be lost from the human body. Uh, so that means, higher amount of heat transfer, which requires higher temperature difference. These aspects will be discussed in detail when we discuss uh, thermal comfort in a later chapter. And depending upon the outside condition, it is not necessary that uh, you always require a refrigerant system for providing thermal comfort. For example, if the outside conditions are uh, uh, very cold and dry, then you require uh, not a refrigerant system, but a heating system. You have to heat and humidify the air and then supply that hot and humidified air to the condition space, so that the condition space can be maintained at the required conditions irrespective of the outside cold and dry conditions. So, you know, this is what is known as uh, winter air conditioning 
and uh, the other opposite is when the outside condition is very hot and humid. Typically, uh, uh, this is a scenario in uh, countries like uh, India and all where the outside conditions are hot and humid in summer. So, you require a refrigeration system which cools and dehumidifies the air and supplies this cold and dehumidified air to the conditioned space so that uh, you can uh, maintain the required temperatures. So, you have a summer air conditioning system and a winter air conditioning system. And if you remember I was mentioning that uh, uh, refrigeration system if you are using it for cooling purposes is required for summer air conditioning. And if you are using a refrigeration system as a heat pump then you can use it for winter air conditioning system also. That means a single refrigeration system uh, depending upon the design can function as an all year air conditioning system provide uh, cooling and dehumidification in uh, summer and uh, heating and humidification in winter. Now, depending upon uh, the end use, uh, 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 comfort air conditioning systems can be classified as uh, residential air conditioning systems, uh, commercial air conditioning systems, air conditioning systems for hospitals and mobile air conditioning systems. And uh, the required capacity and what is the type of reference system to be used and what is the design strategy, what, are, what kind of controls are required, all these things uh, depend upon the uh, final application. That means, you cannot, you do not have a unique solution for all these applications. Depending upon the uh, end use, you have to uh, suggest a suitable system. For example, uh, if, you are, uh, you if you have a system which has to cater to a house, then uh, the temperature, uh, exact uh, temperature uh, requirement is not there. For example, 1 degree plus or minus 1 degree is ok. Whereas, if you are using it for uh, uh, other application where temperature is very critical, uh, then you have to have very good control systems which will maintain the temperature uh, exactly. Whereas, in uh, residential air conditioning systems, you may not uh, require such very sophisticated uh, control systems. Also, typically residential uh, air conditioning systems are of low capacity, whereas large commercial air conditioning systems are of very high capacity. And uh, one special case is the case of mobile air conditioning systems. That means, air conditioning systems used in cars, trains, aircraft, etc. Okay. They require a totally different uh, design method or design strategy, because uh, one typical problem with any mobile air conditioning system is the outside conditions may vary continuously. For example, a train is moving from uh, let us say Kashmir to Kanyakumari, then it encounters all kinds of weather, all kinds of outside conditions as it moves from one place to other place. So, what will be the outside condition? The air conditioning system must uh, maintain the same comfort conditions inside. So, irrespective of outside conditions, you have to have the same inside conditions. So, this is one uh, peculiar aspect of mobile air conditioning systems. Let me show one uh, typical residence uh, uh, air conditioning system used in residences. Uh, this is uh, an air con uh, room, what is known as a room care air conditioner and if you take it out of the casing. So, what you have here, uh, if, you, if you recollect, uh, a typical air conditioning system requires a compressor here and a condenser and an evaporator coil here and an expansion valve. So, it is nothing but a uh, refrigerant system and uh, it also uses some accessories such as an evaporator fan and a condenser fan for uh, improving the heat transfer rate and for the distributing the air. So, this is a typical uh, window type air conditioning systems. Of course, you can also have what you know as a split type of air conditioning system where the condenser and uh, compressor are separated from the evaporator and uh, the expansion valve. That means, you can keep the condensing unit consisting of compressor and the condenser outside the occupied space, whereas uh, this window air conditioner you have to mount it in a window. And uh, the required capacity, normally the required capacity of any refrigerant system is uh, uh, given a unit called uh, tons of refrigeration system. You might have heard uh, people saying uh, 1.5 ton of refrigeration air conditioning system or 2 ton uh, air conditioning system, etc. What is this ton? This ton is uh, a classical uh, unit of uh, uh, refrigeration capacity and uh, 1 ton of refrigeration is uh, equivalent to about 3.51 uh, kilowatt of uh, heat. That means, if a air conditioning system having a um, capacity of 1 ton uh, will be able to uh, extract 3.51 uh, kilowatts of heat from the occupied space. This is the meaning of 
protons. Now let us look at industrial air conditioning systems. The main purpose here as I mentioned earlier is to provide the favorable surrounding conditions so that the required processes can be carried out and required products can be produced. Of course, uh, uh, the industrial air conditioning system must also um, provide at least uh, a partial measure of comfort to the occupants because uh, typically all industries will have a lot of people working there. So you can't really look, a, look at uh, only the product or process point of view, you also have to look at the people. That means the industrial air conditioning system at least provide some amount of comfort to the workers so that they can work efficiently. So these are the two main objectives of any industrial air conditioning system. Now let us look at some of the uh, um, uh, typical industries which require air conditioning. And as I uh, mentioned in case of refrigeration, the requirements uh, here vary from industry, in the industry to industry. That means uh, depending upon what kind of products you are producing or what, what kind of processes uh, are being carried out, uh, the required conditions will be uh, varying. Uh, some of the examples are uh, textile industries. Textile uh, is one of the oldest users of air conditioning. The yarn used in a textile is very sensitive to uh, temperature and humidity. So if you want to have a very high output, uh, you have to maintain the humidity and temperature within certain limits so that uh, the yarn can move at high speeds without breaking. This is the reason why it was used early in the early days and uh, how the output was increased using an air conditioning system. And uh, air conditioning is also required uh, uh, in printing presses. In printing presses, what happens is typically, for, for example, if you look at a color uh, printing press, uh, the ink will be uh, deposited in stages. So, and uh, when the paper moves from one stage to the other stage, the ink has to dry off before it reaches the other stage. For example, let's say that uh, first stage you are depositing red ink and uh, next stage is black ink. By the time the paper uh, moves from the red ink stage to the black ink stage, the ink has to dry. Uh, if it does not dry, then there will be uh, uh, problems and there will be mixing of the colors and all. So you have to um, again maintain uh, certain humidity so that drying can take place, take place within the required time. So uh, all printing presses require very good air conditioning systems. And also uh, the paper used is uh, sensitive to the humidity. So you have to maintain humidity in certain uh, levels so that uh, the paper can, uh, you can prevent the curling of the paper, etc. And uh, as I mentioned already, um, refrigeration is also required or air conditioning is also required in uh, manufacturing of uh, several precision parts. And this is uh, particularly so in case of uh, uh, watches, uh, uh, wrist watches or in case of uh, semiconductor uh, elements and all, uh, where uh, uh, the cleanliness, temperature and humidity are very, very important. For example, if the humidity is not right and if the people start sweating and when they handle the parts with uh, sweating hands, then water gets deposited on the parts which may lead to rusting. Since here the dimensional accuracy is very, very important, uh, you have to prevent uh, any uh, variation in the dimensional accuracy. That means you have to maintain both temperature as well as humidity. Uh, and in fact, all uh, electronic industries, uh, semiconductor uh, making industries and other electronic industries, uh, the uh, air conditioning is a very, very critical uh, requirement. And in those industries, in addition to the temperature and humidity, uh, the cleanliness of air is also very, very important. That means uh, there should not be any dust particles or any other solid particles in the air. So in addition to a good air conditioning system, they also have uh, a variety of uh, filtration equipment which will be filtering air and provides clean air to the uh, conditioned space. Then uh, as I said, uh, semiconductor industries is one of the largest users of air conditioning. And in pharmaceuticals, uh, several pharmaceuticals uh, involve several chemical reactions and all and uh, they require uh, controlled uh, conditions of temperature and humidity. So when they are being produced and when they are being stored, you require uh, certain temperatures and humidity. In fact, uh, you might have uh, seen on many of the uh, medicine bottles and all, they write that uh, store in a cool and dry place. That means the medicine is sensitive to temperature. You have to store it at a, in a cool uh, um, uh, place and it's also sensitive to moisture. That's why they say cool and dry. Then photographic materials. Uh, photographic materials are also very sensitive to moisture and to some extent to temperature also. So uh, again, they require air conditioning. In fact, if you remember, uh, Eastman Kodak is the first uh, company to use air conditioning for storing its photographic products way back in uh, 1900s. 
and air conditioning is very much required in computer rooms especially in large computer centers and all there is a, la a large amount of heat rejection so which has got to be taken out uh, so you require an air conditioning system also in large uh, computer centers there will be lot of heat generation because of uh, people so which also needs to be taken out so all computer centers require uh, good air conditioning systems also the computer uh, centers uh, require uh, clean air also because you should not have any dust particles floating around so typically you have to maintain not only the temperature and humidity but also the cleanliness of air then uh, air conditioning is also required uh, in mines for example mines uh, as you go down uh, uh, the temperature will increase uh, so it will be terribly hot uh, uh, underground and inside the mines and for the workers uh, they have to do a uh, hard work inside the mines that means they will be rejecting lot of heat and outside temperature is very hot uh, very high and a uh, lot of heat generation is there then if uh, air conditioning is not provided then the uh, miner will be subjected to what is known as heat stress and he cannot work properly so all mines require uh, good air conditioning and another important requirement is uh, the air conditioning systems for mines have to provide the fresh air also that means ventilation is also important so uh, you have to again uh, have systems which can provide the right uh, temperature conditions and also the right amount of uh, ventilation inside the mines and uh, uh, air conditioning is also required in large power plants uh, uh, in large power plants, uh, uh, inside conditions will be typically hot because the presence of boilers and other equipments, etc. So the workers will be generally under some heat stress. So you have to provide some amount of comfort by way of air conditioning. This is also true in case of, uh, uh, say, steel industries. Uh, steel industries also inside conditions will be very harsh. So you have to have uh, some kind of an air conditioning system. One problem with uh, large power plants or steel mills, etc., is it is not possible to air conditioning the entire power plant, or you cannot air conditioning an entire steel mill. That's not commercially feasible. So what you have to do, or what is generally done, is uh, they resort to what is known as spot cooling. That means certain uh, areas where the workers are, only those areas are cool, and the uh, rest of the areas are not cool. So this is what is known as spot cooling so by uh, using spot cooling you can provide some uh, measure of comfort to the workers now let us look at one very important aspect uh, of air conditioning what is known as indoor air quality we will see in uh, later uh, lectures that uh, an air conditioning system the energy consumption of an air conditioning system depends upon how much amount of uh, uh, fresh air or how much amount of ventilation that you are providing so in the olden days to reduce energy consumption what people used to do is they used to reduce the amount of fresh air that means they used to recirculate the same air again and again so as to reduce the energy consumption but later it was observed that uh, people who were spending lot of time in air conditioning buildings were suffering from several problems and this uh, uh, is known as uh, the thick building syndrome that means people working in air conditioning buildings uh, uh, experience certain sicknesses and this is known as sick building syndrome and later they found that uh, not only temperature and humidity and air motion uh, but also the quality of air that you are supplying to a conditioned space is very very important this is even more so in nowadays because uh, people are spending a large part of their lives inside the buildings it is uh, estimated that about 80 percent of the time is spent in conditioned space so if the conditioned space is not clean and the air quality is not good then um, people will fall sick uh, as a result of which uh, as, as a separate branch of air conditioning uh, this indoor air quality or iaq uh, it's called as iaq has emerged as a separate uh, branch of air conditioning and it requires uh, different techniques and all to ensure air quality so this is one uh, pertinent and important issue of indoor air quality and as i said uh, any air conditioning system must uh, provide uh, not only required temperatures and all but also a clean and healthy environments in the olden days uh, people were very sure that an air conditioned space provides uh, comfort but they were not really sure whether it is good for health or not and uh, subsequent studies sh have shown that uh, if you don't design an air conditioning system it in fact it can be very unhealthy so nowadays the emphasis is not only on uh, comfort but also on healthy environment so this is the um, uh, area which is dealt with by uh, iaq or indoor air quality 
as i mentioned uh, the sick building syndrome is very common in uh, especially in places uh, Um, where uh, the outside uh, air is dirty and uh, the designer of air conditioning system provides very less uh, ventilation to save energy. So, in the, and the materials used, uh, typically the indoor air quality depends uh, on the amount of ventilation that is provided and what is the quality of outside air or the fresh air that you are supplying and also the what kind of materials you are using inside the conditioned space. So, these three parameters uh, decide whether an environment is uh, healthy or not. And generally, any indoor air quality study recommends uh, the required ventilation qualities and also recommends what kind of materials uh, should be used within the conditioned space and how to treat the air. The fresh air outside air itself may be dirty, then you have to treat the air before you supply it to the conditioned space. So, all these aspects uh, come under uh, the indoor air quality. Now, let us look at another very important issue that is energy. All air conditioning systems uh, consume uh, a large amount of energy and now because of the requirements uh, in all industries and in many office places, residences, etc., the installed air conditioning capacity is increasing tremendously and uh, all these systems require energy, so the energy consumption uh, by the air conditioning systems is also increasing tremendously and in the olden days, uh, people did not care much for the energy consumption of air conditioning systems. So, they were uh, designing the systems without optimizing them, as a result they were consuming lot of energy. So, nowadays uh, the focus has shifted, now people say that uh, the, they want uh, a system which provides not only comfort, but which is also energy efficient. Uh, so, this is second uh, um, uh, issue of uh, any air conditioning system. So, uh, energy efficiency has to be guaranteed by the supplier and by the designer. And the energy efficiency of any air conditioning system uh, depends not only on the air conditioning system, but also on other factors. Let us see what are the factors which decide the energy efficiency of an air conditioning system. Uh, it depends upon the design of the air conditioned building itself. Uh, for example, if the building is not designed uh, to suit uh, properly, then uh, it consume lot of energy. And one, uh, uh, nowadays you might have seen that lot of people use lot of glass. So, use of glass actually is uh, will lead to larger loads on air conditioning system, that means you require a bigger air conditioning system, which will ultimately lead to larger uh, energy consumption. So, here the architect has a role to play. So, the architect uh, uh, with along with the air conditioning engineer has to uh, do the complete system design, so that the total energy consumption is uh, reduced. And people also use uh, names like uh, intelligent uh, buildings, etc., with reference to the energy consumption. And the second important uh, aspect is selection of suitable reference systems. Uh, all re uh, reference systems are not equally good for all applications. So, you have to, depending upon your requirement, you have to select a suitable uh, reference systems. Uh, for example, uh, there are in areas where uh, you have lot of uh, waste heat is available, then it makes sense to select a vapor absorption system which uses uh, the waste heat and not uh, an electrical energy or mechanical energy. So, depending upon the uh, situation, you have to select a required uh, refrigeration system. And the third uh, factor is the selection of suitable indoor conditions. As I mentioned, as I have shown, the optimum uh, indoor temperature varies from anywhere between 20 to 27 or 26 degrees centigrade. And uh, you will see later that if you are trying to maintain lower temperature uh, inside the conditioned space, that will lead to higher energy consumption. That means a lower conditioned uh, space temperature means in general higher uh, energy consumption. So, if it is not absolutely required, uh, we must may try to may keep the temperature on the higher side to reduce the energy consumption. And several factors again come into picture here. For example, uh, you are designing an air conditioning system for summer. Uh, and uh, it is a typical office building, uh, let us say, and uh, everybody in the office is wearing very heavy clothing. So, as I mentioned, uh, the everybody is wearing heavy clothing like uh, uh, suits, etc., then you have to maintain lower uh, condition space temperature, so that he can reject the heat. That means, uh, lower uh, temperature in the condition space and higher energy consumption. And if the same person is wearing light clothing, then you can uh, have a higher uh, temperature in the condition space. Uh, uh, and thereby you can reduce the energy consumption. So, the selection of suitable temperature, this is also very important. Of course, sometimes this can be a psychological aspect also. People may think that lower temperature is better, uh, but it is the job of the air conditioning engineer to convince uh, that uh, it is not necessarily so and the required comfort temperature 
uh, is not a single point but it is a range. And uh, selection of suitable controls, uh, you can also reduce the energy consumption of an air conditioning building by uh, using um, uh, suitable controls. Uh, for example, uh, if you have an uh, air conditioning system which uses a variable speed compressor, uh, so you can reduce the uh, energy consumption using an efficient variable speed compressor. Uh, so you require a control uh, which will uh, be able to vary the compressor speed. Then uh, other uh, aspect is the use of uh, thermal energy storage systems. Uh, the concept here is like this, in there are many places where the night temperature can be very low and the day temperature can be very high. For example, places like uh, deserts uh, where nights are very cold and days are very hot. Uh, so in such uh, cases you can use the concept of thermal energy storage, that means you can store the cold in the night and you can uh, use the part of it uh, to offset the heating in the daytime. In fact, this is also the reason uh, why old buildings like uh, old temples, forts, etc., they are comfortable even in summer because there the walls are so thick uh, that they store a lot of thermal energy and thereby they provide um, uh, comfort even without uh, any artificial air conditioning system. So the thermal energy storage can be uh, provided uh, by way of the walls itself or you can also have other means of providing thermal energy storage. So these are uh, the ways by which you can uh, control the energy consumption and improve the energy efficiency of an air conditioning system. Now let us conclude this uh, lesson. Uh, we have seen that uh, the scope of refrigeration and air conditioning uh, is really very wide and the applications are very diverse. Uh, and uh, uh, it has grown tremendously thanks to the efforts of uh, thousands of scientists and uh, engineers over a period of uh, say 100 to 150 years. So it is not the, the result of a single man's effort but it is the effort of many people. Uh, and right now as I mentioned uh, the issues of co concern uh, are uh, first is uh, energy efficiency and second uh, important issue is uh, eco-friendliness. That means the refrigerant systems that you are using uh, should be eco-friendly, they should not uh, create any damage in the environment. Uh, these are the important uh, concerns and people are working on uh, to develop systems which are both eco-friendly as well as energy efficient. Uh, thank you and uh, based on this lesson I uh, have given uh, some questions, uh, the answers uh, to this will be provided in subsequent uh, lessons. Thank you.